Good morning, Smoky Mountain. God is good all the time. Amen. God bless you all for being here this morning, for visiting with us today, watching us online today. We're sure glad you're here with us as well. In the chairs in front of me, there should be like a little blue card. We have a couple of people flying them up there. If you can just take a moment and fill that out, drop that in the offering plate when it comes by, we sure would appreciate that. If you're a regular attendee, need to update your personal information, have a prayer concern or something like that, I'll be sure to fill that out, drop that in the offering plate as well, and we'll make note of, of those things as, as, as well. Um, if you have your bulletins in front of you, you'll notice there's a lot of information in them today. I'll kind of just hit the highlights for this week, but there's a lot of stuff like on the back of your sermon notes, there's some, some stuff about Christmas coming up, and you just kind of encourage you all to study and read through your, your bulletin uh, sometime this afternoon so you know, you know what's going on. But this week, I remind you again, on Monday, Wednesday, or tonight and Wednesday night, our Hispanic worship service happens at 7.30. As you know, you're always welcome to come be a part of that, and I think you will be blessed if you ever come and want to be a part of that and uh, for that. Tomorrow night, we have elders meeting at 6, and also the women of ministry will also meet at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Uh, Tuesday night, uh, tentatively, we have a membership and evangelism meeting scheduled. I'm waiting for some information if you're part of that committee, and uh, I may have to postpone that based on uh, some information. I'm waiting to get in on that, but uh, if you're part of that committee, we'll be part of that committee. We meet at 6, six o'clock t- uh, Tuesday night. Wednesday night, we'll be watching uh, episode two of season two of The Chosen, and we'll be kind of a little discussion time after watching that. If you want to come and jump in on that, we sure to appreciate that. And next Saturday's a big day, kind of a busy day. As well, at 8 o'clock Saturday morning, uh, Dan Eisenhower will let you know that we will be doing another hike in the Smokies. Uh, you can meet here at the church at 8 o'clock or uh, meet out at the Townsend Y at 9 a.m. We will be trying to hike to Abrams Falls that day. And if you have any, any questions, information about that, you can see Dan Eisenhower uh, uh, about that. And, of course, Saturday evening is our community Thanksgiving dinner. And I encourage you all to come out and be a part of that. Bring your family and friends. Just the time to fellowship. Uh, we're going to start preparing about one. So if you willing to come and help with the preparation on that we sure would appreciate that as well and then we'll start serving between five and seven you can come anytime between that two hours um uh because it's you know it's gonna be kind of like a an ongoing serving line uh, through those through those two hours so I encourage you to come be a part of that and uh, uh just celebrate in that and again there's a lot of other stuff coming on and you know, we're going to ring the bells for salvation army there's a sign up sheet for that in the back and on the back of your sermon notes there's a lot of information about some things coming up for christmas like Winter Coat Drive, Angel Tree, and of course Christmas Eve as, as well. So uh, keep all of, that, all of that in front of you and um, encourage you all to be here. It's a special time of year at, at Smoky Mountain. Amen. Uh, Severe County Food Ministries, we are collecting instant mashed potatoes, instant oatmeal, and ramen noodles and snack cakes for the month of, of November for, for that. So. All right, this morning, uh, uh, you, you'll find out here in a few minutes, uh, you don't have to listen to me this morning. You can all get amen for that, right? So, um, uh, Joe Hines from the Woodburn Christian Children's Home is here this, this weekend. Uh, yep, he was in town for a wedding, and he's going to be bringing the message this morning. So I look forward to hearing Joe. Always does a great job, and, and appreciate the update, update he'll give us on the, on the children's home as well. So uh, encourage him, give him the amens, the oh yeahs, like, like, you, like you do for me. I, pre- I know he'll appreciate that and thrive off of that. Right, Joe? All right. Oh, yeah. There we go. Thank you, James. So, uh, oh, and by the way, Joe, if they're not... Amen to you like that you want them to. I've got this little sign up here that says, can I get an amen? You can just flash that, and they should know what that means. All right? All right? See, there you go. That's how that works. Pardon? Well, that'll work, too. That'll work, too, as well. Um, it is Veterans Day weekend. I, I think I just want to take a moment, and uh, if we have any veterans in the room, would you all please stand? 
Let's give him a hand. Thank you all, gentlemen, for your, your service and sacrifice for our community, for our nation, so we can do what we're doing here this morning. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray, and uh, we'll go into our time of worship. Uh, Father God, it is good to be in this place, Lord. You're an awesome and holy God, and we thank you for the opportunity to have to come together here as family and friends to worship your, your awesome and holy name today, Lord. Uh, God, I pray that you'll be those who, uh, who cannot be here today, Lord, those who are, are sick or are traveling, God. I pray that you'll bring healing to their bodies and bring them back to us again very soon, Lord. Lord, those who've traveled to the Smoky Mountains this weekend, Lord, for a little getaway, a little vacation time, God, I pray that their time here has been a little bit of restful and relaxing and enjoyable. And as they return back to their homes and their communities, God, I pray to give them safety in their journeys back home. I pray that they're, they're revived and ready to go back and serve in their church and their communities and in and, and their corner of the world as well, God. God, we thank you for the privilege we have to worship you. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for the men and women around this country that have, have paid the price so that we can do what we're here doing here today, Lord. And I thank you for their, their, their example of service and sacrifice, God. We thank you most importantly for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price so that we could have the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life with you in heaven, God. And, and I pray that we never take that lightly, Lord. Lord, as we come to this time of worship, I, I pray that uh, you will, uh, you'll be blessed by our worship here to this morning, Lord, uh, how we meditate, how we listen, how we sing, how we fellowship, Lord, I pray blesses you, cause you to say, those are my children, I love them, I'm so proud of them, and Lord, I pray that your spirit will work in and through this service today, I pray to be with Joe as he brings the message and the update from the children's home, guy. thank you for the work that's going on there, and I pray that you'll, you'll, you'll use his ministry and the, the children's home to uh, uh, change some, some young people's lives for all eternity, God. God, we love you. We praise you in your precious and son's name. We pray and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Would you stand, please? Our call to worship comes from Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 34. At judgment, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothes you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king, Jesus, will say, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I, for one, and I know you are too, are thankful that we have been blessed. We have been blessed to be a blessing to others. And I'm thankful for the wonderful grace of Jesus, aren't you? Amen. Let's sing together. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How how my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches. Just the men, wonderful, the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Ladies, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Everyone, scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the name of Jesus. of Jesus reaching to all the lost by it I have been pardoned saved to the uttermost chains have been torn asunder 
wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Ladies, the mountains sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Everyone, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making Him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me, men. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Ladies, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the... but we got through it, right? And we're thankful. All right. Great is thy faithfulness. Aren't you thankful for that? Great is thy, because I'm not always faithful, but he is always faithful. Let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer Time and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand besides. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. 
A couple of weeks ago, the preacher said, the most profound thing I ever heard was, Jesus loves me, this I know. Let's sing that. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago. Taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Would you be seated, please? Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O Lord, have mercy on me. Let us take the cup together on our knees. Let us take the cup together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. When I told Alan the communion meditation was going to have to do with the song in the garden, he told me that it wasn't about the Garden of Gethsemane, but the Garden of Gods in Colorado, and uh, that's a place I've never been, and I put a lot of pictures of it up because it's a beautiful place. Ah, he went away. That's what happens when you get old. But there's a song we sing, and I don't think it's necessarily my experience it says I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the son of God discloses but the scripture says 
he being Jesus went out and as was his custom to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him and when he came to the place he said to them pray that you may not enter into temptation and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed saying father if you are willing remove this cup from me Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from praying, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And my song would be, I come to the garden never alone, for Jesus is with me and temptation awaits me. The voice I hear falling on my ear says, Let's get ready to rumble. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for overcoming temptation for us help us to resist and overcome temptation in our own gardens the men will come
well, now that I've ruined one of your favorite songs, I'm talking about, you know, I love to talk about the joy and cheerfulness of giving. And as they say on TV, this is based on a true story. You've got to take the joy of giving with you out of here. It can't stay here. And if you do, maybe someday someone bigger than you, stronger than you, smarter than you, better looking than you, who makes more money than you do, even may have authority over you. In other words, someone that you have nothing to offer will grab you by the lapels and lift you up and pin you against the wall and say, I want some of what you're taking. And you can whisper, Jesus. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you want us to give in joy, that we can share with the world our material gifts, but we also want to share with the world the joy of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Smoky Mountain Christian Church. It is so good to be back with you. For those who don't know me, Joe Hines, I'm the executive director at the Christian Children's Home, and I spent several years with my family down here in this neck of the woods before, obviously, we made God mad, and he sent us up north, northeast Indiana, which is where we've been living in exile ever since, uh, really, since 2009. So be careful making God mad. No, but it's, it's good to be back, and it was great to participate yesterday in the wedding of David and Sarah, Mr. and Mrs. David Harrison. Who would have thunk? Uh, it's been such a great experience, and, but I don't come alone. Besides the multiple personalities on board, I'm here with my wife, Vicki, uh, and she has, yes, we should give her a round of applause. She's been part of the show for a long time now, and so we're thankful for her perseverance. And Victoria, our daughter's here with our favorite son-in-law, Zach Harrison. And best of all, they brought our two grandkids. So we have entered the promised land of parenting. Uh, we have four grandkids, and we're thankful for their contribution to that experience in, in our life. And we're good here, we're, and we're thankful to be here. And, and, and our thankfulness doesn't just come from our own hearts. It also overflows from the hearts of the children at the Woodburn Christian Children's Home. They send you their greetings. They are thankful. These kids uh, experience a lot of difficulties in life. They've lived tragic lives uh, before coming into our care. No one comes to the Woodburn Christian Children's Home on a winning streak. It's like these pictures up here. Uh, you see those pictures up in, the, up in the corner, the round ones? Every one of those girls in those pictures, they don't know their biological father, but their house dads take them to a father-daughter banquet. It's what they experience with us. That girl in the mirror, middle, as she's trying to understand what is love. Because what she experienced before she came to us wasn't love. But with us, we get to help her fill in those definitions. Love is patient. Love is kind. And on and on and on. Of course, the other one's there, the girl waving to us on the water. She never went to a lake before, 13 years old. 
Neglect and abuse comes in a lot of different forms. And, and she swore she would never get onto water because she was terrified. We couldn't get her off the wakeboard uh, when we taught her. At the Woodburn Christian Children's Zone, we don't raise victims. We raise overcomers. And these children are overcomers. Yeah, that's probably a good amen. We don't raise victims. We raise overcomers. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, I mean, that's, and that's where we come from. And, and all of us have something to overcome. I mean, don't we all have something to overcome? So the children at the Children's Home send you their greetings. And as you would expect, they send you their jokes because they think my sermons are boring. Uh, so if you're giggling on the front end, at least you'll have a good joke. And these jokes uh, come from some of the kids, and they come from some of the adult kids, like Victoria. This joke right here, what do dentists call an x-ray? What does a dentist call an x-ray? A toothpick. Duh. Yes. I didn't say they were good jokes. They're from the kids. Yes, yes, yes. And a good, another good one here is, and this is from uh, Little Jackson. This is a good one. Why do cows wear bells? I mean, I didn't know much about the farming community until we moved in the middle of the farm country. But why do cows wear bells? Well, she said, because their horns don't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it. I tell you, at the Woodbury Christian Children's, we live for teachable moments. Uh, and, and consider those your teachable moments of today. We live for teachable moments in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different settings, through a lot of different experiences, we learn and live for teachable moments. Opportunities to integrate the gospel into every life. Opportunities to integrate hope and truth into every life, everyday life. And, and this happens everywhere, uh, in our homes, in our churches, on the highways and everywhere in between. Even at this church, teachable moments. When I was serving here as a youth minister way back in 2008, there was a lot of teachable moments for myself as well as the kids in the youth group at the time. And one of the kids in the youth group at the time was Zach Harrison, your own Zach Harrison. And it was, he had some really wonderful teachable moments in, in youth group that year. Uh, one of the things he learned is how to pick friends. Specifically, he learned that not everything is as it appears. They kind of go hand in hand. So I had to teach this to Zach and the other kids in the youth group, and I did this with an object lesson. And so what we did with this object lesson, it was, you know, around Halloween time, so we had caramel apples. And the kids in the youth group were going to have a caramel apple eating contest. The girls versus the boys. And so we took the caramel apples, we put them on the table, we gave the girls 60 seconds to eat as much of the caramel apples as was possible, and they did. They chowed down these three girls on these caramel apples. Then it was the boys' turn. And these boys, the three boys I picked were those three boys in the youth group that you just want to put into a closet and throw away the key. One of which was Zach Harrison. Uh, and of course, uh, he, they were going to beat the girls big time in this apple eating contest because I kind of I got them going and they were excited and they were all pumped up and, and so they lived for these teachable moments and I believe at the Woodburn Christian Children's Home that runs at the very core of our experience teachable moments and, and I believe with that we are to live a life on mission where we take time to integrate the gospel truth, the gospel hope, and the love of the gospel into the teachable moments. And that's our responsibility to do so. Life is an adventure to be experienced, not a task to be completed. And the life on mission is the moment in the adventure where we get to bring together the eternal truths with the everyday experiences. And that's important for us. The challenge, I believe, for the church, for us today, is to live a life on mission where we're looking for those teachable moments, where we bring the gospel right into the everyday life, where we bring the gospel into the caramel-covered onions. <laughs> the teachable moments. So we're actually going to go into Mark chapter 5, and we're going to learn from the Master today. We want to learn from Jesus the Christ, who lived a life on mission perfectly. Jesus never missed an opportunity. He never missed a teachable moment to bring the eternal truths of the good news into the everyday lives of the people. Wherever he was going, whatever he was doing, Jesus the Christ took advantage of those teachable moments because he lived life on mission absolutely perfectly. And as our master, as our Christ, the anointed one, as the son of God, we need to take a lesson 
from the master. So Mark chapter 5, we're going to step through this, and we're going to try to see how Jesus lived a life on mission, and we want to check out this, te this teachable moment that just jumps out of the page at us. So I'm going to read a little bit of this passage, and we're going to comment on it. We're going to just kind of step right through it. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV as noted on the screen. It might be a little different than your rendering of the original language, but it's really close together. So here we go. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Now, we're going to come back to that phrase because they came to the other side of the sea sets up the context. So it's one of those, like I mentioned last time I was here, it's a speed bump passage. So when you see a speed bump passage, you have to slow down. Now, I'm from the East Coast, from the Philadelphia area. When I see a speed bump, I speed up. Don't tell me what to do. But in this particular case, uh, we want to slow down on this speed bump. All right, so uh, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. Listen to this description. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. This is a very interesting passage because Jesus, after he crossed the sea, the Sea of Galilee, stepped out of the boat and immediately was confronted with what I call a mess of a man. I mean, this man was a mess. Listen to his description. Just look at the words on the screen. I mean, he was a mess. And, and this, this context was, was highlighted by a word that Mark, the evangelist, uh, the, the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark, Mark employs the word immediately in this context to show us a significant change of events. Matter of fact, Mark employs the word immediately 16 times in the Gospel to help us understand that something is changing very immediately, very carefully, showing us the movements through the life of Christ, this life on mission. So immediately, he was confronted with a mess of a man. And, and I believe this confronting is really a contextual way of showing us a contrast, because the contrast is all over this passage. Uh, the contrast of what the disciples were experiencing and what that mess of a man was experiencing. I say that because of the context. This opening ver verse where it says they came to the other side of the sea. When they were coming across the sea, the disciples had experienced something that's recorded for us in chapter 4, and it sets up the, contact, the contrast. In chapter 4, verse 35, let me just read a little bit of this passage. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go to the other side of the sea. And they're leaving the crowd they took with him, uh, him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. So the storm is raging, and Jesus is asleep on the cushion. There's a contrast there. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke. And he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. Another contrast. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And then I love this passage. Jesus says to the disciples in the boat, he says to him, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that the wind and the sea obeyed him? So picture these disciples in the boat. Now, this is a large boat, almost maybe as long as this stage, very wide, 12, 14 people in it. It's a deep boat. It's not a row boat, as we would understand. But it's a deep wooden boat. And so when it's going through the water, they're rowing it. And this great storm comes upon them, and Jesus rebukes the storm in their fear. And then who else does Jesus rebuke? The disciples themselves. He rebukes the disciples. I don't know if you've ever driven in a car full of kids and rebuked the kids. Uh, what do they normally do? They drive in silence afterwards. 
I remember serving at the Parkway Church of Christ as where I came to Christ. At, and one of the elders told me, you know, he knew we had four kids, crazy kids. We take them to church in the morning. They're losing their minds in the back seat on the way to church in the morning. And Bill Koch, the elder, said to me with a smile on, he, on his face, Joe, you know how to deal with a car full of crazy kids on the way to church? I'm like, no, please tell me. He's like, it's all about timing. I'm like, timing? He's like, yeah, you have to just hit the brake just right so they all lean forward at the same time so you hit them all at once. It's all about, it's all about timing. When you rebuke a car full of kids, typically, they typically drive in silence after being rebuked. Or when you pull the car, get back on the road again. They drive. I imagine after Jesus rebuked these disciples, on some level, I don't want to overly dramatize this, but on some level, they may have been rowing the rest of the way across the sea in silence. In this sense of, who then is this? That's a question that Mark wrestles with in this gospel. Who then is this Jesus? That even the wind and the sea obey him. In that posture of the heart, they're rowing across the Sea of Galilee. The water's lapping up against a wooden boat. They're silent. And then they get to the other side of the sea in this posture. And then we read immediately. There met them a man out of the tombs. The silence the contrast of the disciples in the boat and that man who had been living a tragic life wandering among the tombs. I, I truly believe that the message is in the contrast of this passage. And we could just draw it out. Immediately Jesus was confronted with this man. And think about the contrast between the disciples in the boat and the mess of a man on the shore. Uh, the disciples in the boat, they had just experienced Jesus and his power over nature. Uh, but the man, uh, the man on the shore was seized with the dark power of evil. Uh, the men in the boat had been living with Jesus for at least six months, spiritually clean, so to speak, whereas the man on the shore was living among the dead, which would have made him spiritually unclean. Uh, the behavior of the man uh, breaking the shackles uh, was an indication that he couldn't be controlled, whereas Jesus had been showing his power over disease and evil spirits all along. Uh, the man cried on a mountaintop. Have you ever heard anybody cry, like guttural, deep sense of terror? It's a horrible sound to hear someone screaming. Uh, he was screaming amongst the tombs, and they had just heard Jesus say, peace be still, to the storm. What a contrast these decided. They were on a life on mission, for sure. And, and of course, the last thing, the man was cutting himself with rocks. I don't know if you realize this, but self-harm among young people, especially girls in this country, is an absolute epidemic. Uh, at least 45% of the girls, middle school and high school girls, are either cutting themselves or know a friend who's cutting themselves. It is an ap epidemic amongst our young people. The pain on the inside trying to be voiced on the outside. It's horrendous. There's nothing new under the sun. This man was self-harming him. He was cutting himself with stones to express the pain. What a contrast that we're seeing here. The context of the passage created a startling contrast. But isn't that life on mission? Where the saved come in contact with the unsaved? Christ, Jesus, coming in contact with this mess of a man? That is life on mission. And, and so the question to the church is, who is your mess? Who's the person that God has thrust into your life? Who's your mess? Is it a family member? Is it the person you work with? Is it, is it the person who cut you off in traffic on the way here? Who's your mess? Uh, is it a person at church? Uh, who? Everybody's got a mess. And life on mission, the saved coming in contact with the unsaved, that's the goal. At the Woodburn Christian Children's Home, nobody comes there on a winning streak. We know that. 
Uh, and it's usually generational. Two or three generations deep goes the mess, whether it's alcoholism, drug addiction, domestic violence, incarceration, just across the board. These children have acute childhood experiences that cause their behaviors to be off the chart. Uh, children come to us because of behaviors, right? But it's not about the behavior. Every time I come here, I remind myself and everybody sitting here that the behaviors are just the illustration of the story the children are living. It's called a trauma-informed environment. The behavior of a child or an adult child is just an illustration of the narrative they're living. If you see a child cutting himself, what's the narrative? If you see a child injuring a small animal, what's the narrative? If you see a child who is willing to do whatever it takes to fit in, what's the narrative? Kids come to us for behaviors. It's like reading a storybook, a children's storybook, like the Ugly Duckling. One side of the storybook, there's the writing of the story. The left side of the storybook is the picture that illustrates the writing. A child's behavior is just the illustration of the story they've lived. And it doesn't have to be actually what they lived. It's what they think they've lived. And that's just as important because they're acting on it. Life on mission brings the saved in contact with the unsaved. Because after all, we've all agreed, life is a series of teachable moments. And our challenge is to bring the gospel into the teachable moment. Jesus brought the gospel into this teachable moment in a very profound way. Listen to how this story continues to unfold after he met the mess of a man. Immediately thrust into his experience, we read in verse 6, And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirits. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. I'm not even sure who's talking here. Is it the man or is it the evil spirit in the man? It's a very interesting dialogue. Uh, and of course, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. It's a very interesting dialogue that Jesus has with this mess of a man uh, and there's a lot of aspects of this dialogue certainly the evil spirits knew the identity of Jesus uh, and and they knew of his power Jesus cast out those evil spirits into the pigs the pigs take center stage in this story but but there's a lot of things we could talk about you know we could talk about the legion the name of the evil spirits we could talk about the pigs we could talk about the loss of revenue that would be the result of the pigs going in the water. We could talk about the conversation with the evil one or the hillside or the sea, or we could draw a picture of the pigs floating in the sea. But today, on this Life on Mission Day, I think we need to focus on the fact that Jesus rescued the man, claiming him as his own. The man was claimed by the evil spirit, and Jesus rescued him and claimed him as his own. The man was lost, but now he was found. Jesus demonstrated his eternal power and authority.
<laughs> Always revolves around you. Um, yeah, most of you know me. Um, I'm Vicki. We were serving here several years back. Um, the person that you see in front of you today is not a reflection of uh, the backdrop or where I came from. My daughter's leaving because I don't think she can handle. Yeah, there she goes. She waved at me. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> um, does not reflect the backdrop of where I came from. I grew up in a very um, dysfunctional home. There was physical, sexual, emotional abuse. And um, out of that, and not that that's an excuse or a reason for uh, choices that I made, because I made, I made my own choices. And I ended up getting into drugs and alcohol and going down some really bad paths. Um, somewhere in my late 20s, I, I think I was just given a gift of desperation. I, had, I was in a pit and it was dark and I didn't know where to go from there. Um, I had been in counseling, um, nothing against counseling because it definitely helped get me to a point. But there was so much shame and guilt um, and counselors, especially in the secular world, they can't tell you how to deal with those things. Um, and the cutting, I was cutting before cutting was even a thing because uh, I didn't know how to, you know, get that pain out. Um, in my late 20s, uh, Victoria was about two years old, and my grandmother, uh, which is odd because i get, I got to tell you this real quick. So my family, this is how we went to church, okay? We all went to church. We always sat in the back row. That was like our row for our family. And... Um, after church, we all went back to grandma's for uh, dinner, all of us. There was like a lot of us, like 20 of us. Maybe not quite that many, but it felt like a lot. And <laughs> my uncle was at one end of the table, grandfather on the other end. They're screaming at each other, yelling, fighting, um, people cussing, um, you know, grandparents talking about, oh, you know, did you see so-and-so, and kind of gossiping about church people. and. And so this was church to me, very confusing, plus all the other abuses and stuff that was going on. Really made things messy for me. Um, but then in my late 20s, my grandmother started saying, you know, Rick, the, the preacher of the Parkway Church, um, he's been asking about you, and he would really, because he knew I went to Bible college. I thought Bible college was also going to help, you know, fix me and give me some peace, and that didn't work either. But... Um, not that it didn't work, because God was there, and he probably saved me from doing some other crazy things um, while I was there. But he knew I had a Bible college education, and so he, he was kind of reeling me in through my grandmother. So eventually I did go back to church. But when I went back to church, I went with a different lens. Um, and I had to leave church for a little while because... Um, I just felt like God could not handle my mess. And when I went back to church, I listened differently. I went with a different focus. I went not to just learn stuff about God, because I knew a lot of stuff about God. I went to Bible college, had a lot of book knowledge. Um, I could quote Bible verses for you that meant nothing to me because they weren't internalized. I didn't have that personal relationship with God until I went back. And God welcomed me with open arms. And in that process, um, well, I guess right before that process, because um, I was with Joe already for two years um, before I went back to church. And he said he was a Christian, but he wasn't going to church, and whenever we would talk about church, it was like a knockdown, drag out fight, so I just, I just stopped talking to him about church, 
I didn't invite him anymore to the kids' things. And um, I just kept going. And God helped me get strong, helped me develop that relationship. And then in our personal relationship, Joe and I, um, it was 2001, right after the towers were hit. It was my 34th birthday. And I was just at a point where I, I can't live like this anymore. So he moved out two months later, and I'm thinking, you know, we're going to get divorced. <coughs> I, I don't know what's going to happen at this time. It, it was very strange to me. Like, I'm back in church. I'm doing these things. Isn't it supposed to get better, <laughs> not worse? Um, well, God had a plan the whole time, not only for me, but for my husband. And he ended up coming to Christ. Um, and then his midlife crisis was to go into ministry instead of buy a sports car. So <laughs> we went to Johnson. And, um, you know, I was still going through a lot of things, dealing with my shame and my guilt and my mess that I was bringing with me. Because, you know, you don't, you don't just pack it in a suitcase and leave it somewhere. And... Um, we were at Johnson, and God was working on me, and then we came here. And Judy, I don't know if you remember this, but we were getting ready to leave here and go to our first ministry, and I was freaking out. Because <laughs> if you knew, if you knew where I came from and what I did, you wouldn't even want to look at me. You wouldn't want to know me. And I was telling Judy how scared I was. And she said, Vicki, you just go there and you just be yourself. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know if that's going to work. I was so, I was so scared. And... I had to pray a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And somehow, God gave me some kind of peace that I could at least take the next step and then take another step and take another step. And then, oh my goodness, now we're in Auburn, Indiana, and I'm a preacher's wife, and people are looking at me, and I don't know if you know this, but people look at ministers' wives a little bit differently then they look at other women in the church. <laughs> and that was a little freaky. And even, like, I, I got a job, and I was working in Fort Wayne, and, you know, a little more of a diverse population. I didn't even want people to know that I was a preacher's wife because I did not want to be on any kind of pedestal. I did not want anybody thinking I was something because I was a minister's wife. I wouldn't tell people. And then one day, this African-American co-worker, and I have to say that because they look at preacher's wives a little bit. Like, she called me the first lady. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. So, but God was there. He was there through every step of everything. And um, today... Uh, you know, we serve in ministry unashamed, and, um, and I just thank you for letting me be here and share that little piece of my life, my backstory.
Nobody is beyond the power of Jesus. Who is your man? Who needs to hear the gospel in your life? I know who needs to hear the gospel in my life. I know the kids. I know their stories. I know who needs who needs to hear the gospel in your life. Are they there? like we read in Psalm 107, let the, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Everybody's got a story of God's glory. What's your story of God's glory? What it was like, what happened, what it's like now. That's the story of God's glory. Live the adventure. Live the life on mission. Seize the opportunity. Bring the gospel truth into the hearts of the mass. And let God show it out. We are grateful the Old Testament when Moses was in that battle, that spiritual battle. And every time he let his arms down, they got, got worse. And every time he lifted his arms up, it got better. And his arms got tired. And Aaron and Ur held his arms up. You folks hold our arms up when they get tired. And we are grateful. Let's have a word of prayer. Be gracious, Father, you are a God who gives beyond measure. A God who steps into our mess in such a way that we can never have Lord, we're thankful for Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would draw on to you all those who need to hear the message and you would use your church to do that. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is our invitation song. Time when you have the opportunity to say and do uh, whatever needs done in your life. You need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. You need help where you are, whatever the need is. You come, talk to Brian, one of the elders. It's actually a prayer we're going to sing. Make me a blessing. Shine where 
where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. May given to you in your need to master loved you be to the helpless a helper indeed unto your mission be true make me a blessing make me a blessing Amen. God is good. All the time. 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 Amen. Every day. Amen. Y'all may be seated for a moment. Joe, you and your wife want to come up here for a moment? Um, Thank you all very, as always, appreciate your ministry and appreciate your testimony as well. So, uh, um, as you all know, we recently sold a piece of property, and um, uh, of course, we're trying to, we are we're tithing that, 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 that property, and uh, Joe's here today, we're going to make a presentation out of that, of that, of that, out of that property, of the sales of that property, so I'll let Elaine go ahead and uh, make that presentation. So. Yeah, as you know, we, um, they tithe a part of that property money, and they give it to the mission. Sorry. Um, and they gave us uh, quite a big sum. So we had the task of figuring out who was going to get what with all the different missions that we um, support. And uh, Ed Lamar, who's our chairperson, he sent out letters to all of our uh, people that we do support, our missionaries and um, organizations, and asking them, what do you have needs? You know, we have a little bit of money, so what are your needs? And so Joe was one of those, of course, for the, um, for the children's home sent back a letter, explained what some of those needs were, so we want to be faithful and give you back some money. So we have a check for $15,000 to add to your your money. Well, thank you so much. That is above and beyond anything we could ever, ever imagine. And please know that we receive a check from you folks, but it translates into a deep caring concern for the kids in our care. The kids receive so much more than a check. They receive this kingdom participation, which is what we teach them. They feel like throwaways when they come to us, but folks like you help them feel like they're part of something greater than themselves, knit into that fabric of love. So thank you so much for your generosity, your care and concern, and for just being there for our family for so many years. And thank you for raising up Zach. Next time, teach him not to eat onions. He did win. <laughs> uh, I'm going to pray over you guys. Yes, so, uh, if y'all want to do this, come put your hands out there. So I'd like to pray over or pray with them this morning. Let's pray for them. Father, I got to come before this morning. Lord, thank you for Joe and the ministry of Woodburn Tr- Children's Home. God, I pray in Jesus' name your blessing be upon them, upon his work. I pray that you'll give them uh, the wisdom to lead that organization well, God, and the love in his heart and his life to bless these children and bless their families, God. We thank you for what they're doing up there. And God, I pray for their work and their ministry, God. And we just pray that you'll watch out, but take care of them as they head back home. And uh, to continue to bless that ministry at Woodburn, God. We thank you for your blessing, Smoky Mountain, and ability that we can be a blessing to be a blessing to, to so many people, Lord. And uh, thank you for that, God. We love you. We praise you in your precious son's name. We pray. And all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Say it again. God is good.
All the time. I do that every week, and I, and I hope, I hope you know, it kind of doesn't become monotonous to it. We really realize that God is good. Amen? Amen. Let's, all, let's all stand. Um, we'll see in one closing song. Remind you all, we do have a brief congregational meeting. So if you're a member of the church here, we do have a brief meeting after the worship. Uh, we'll take about a five-minute break after we sing this final song for our visitors and such to, to, to break out. But uh, we encourage our congregation to stay around for our congregational meeting. Let, let's, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we love you, praise you for your awesome love and grace you've shown us in so many ways. Lord, I pray that you will watch out, protect us, Lord. I pray that you be with our, our visitors, our guests who's here today, Lord. I pray that their time here has been a blessing. I pray their time in the smoking has been a blessing. I pray that you watch out, protect them as they head back to their homes and their communities and their churches, Lord. Again, I want to pray for your blessing upon Joe and the Woodburn Children's Home. God, I just, just pray that you continue to do great work there. God, we love you. It's been a blessing to be in your house today, your, your place of worship, Lord. And uh, may we go be the church in this community today, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Fifty years ago, Dwayne Friend said, It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. That's our closing song this morning. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. It's a spiritual warfare. And like uh, we heard in the communion meditation, it's uh, time to rumble. stay for the meeting, but if you need to leave, you have four and a half minutes to exit the building.
Okay, okay. Give me a little mic, okay? Okay. Testing, one, one, two. Okay, got it. All right, if everybody that's going to stay, come on up here and get you a seat. We'll get through with this just in a few minutes, okay? I got a few sheets that's been passed out. One of them is our financial uh, 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 budget, and the other one is a financial statement on the last one that we had there. You'll have those in your possession to keep. So, uh, uh, And anything else that we might have to say here this evening or this afternoon, uh, feel free to ask uh, me or one of the other elders or the preacher or the, uh, the deacons that's here, so the leadership. You know, I, I believe that uh, the message was well well taken and I've always said that a Christian life is a life lived for Christ and I think that was to the point here today in Joe, Joe's sermon and uh, that is, uh, 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 is, is our mission here is to live a life of Christ for Christ uh, you probably have before you right now uh, the uh, let me get my glasses on I may not read something just right here did everybody get a, a copy of the uh, uh, congregation uh, uh, proposed budget? And the other one was uh, a copy of the uh, 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 labor in our, uh, in our budget. So uh, if you didn't get one of those, we have plenty of them up here. You can see me afterwards. And if you have any questions on any of that, you can, you can ask me or one of the others, okay? All right. Uh, every year at this time, uh, it's in our, uh, it's in our uh, uh, meetings that we have this congregational meeting. And this is the church at Smoky Mountain Christian Church, SMCC. So uh, this is meeting is uh, mainly for you, and let us share with you what's going on, what's going to be going on, uh, you know, this coming year. And I want to just say, and everybody, please hear me. I'm thankful for Smoky Mountain Christian Church and what they've done this past year, and I believe that greater things are ahead for Smoky Mountain Christian Church. So uh, that's always present in my mind. All right, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we also, uh, uh, I have a, a copy of David's come up while I'm talking, and we all can uh, teach somebody what to get a copy of a uh, book. I'm start with you, everything is, Everything's above board and everything because we are the church here at Smoky Mountain Christian Church. So that's that's great. And I have a rough copy of the mission report. Uh, if you want a copy of that, and, uh, and that was part of it that we presented to Joe in the in the Christian uh, home up there that they serve. So if you want one of those, just take a rough copy and uh, thank you, Brother Lance, for, for doing that. And uh, it shows you. You can ask us, and if you want one of these, they are up here. Uh, so, uh, our meeting is uh, is uh, a meeting that we want to discuss with you as the church body, and to uh, uh, move forward in the upcoming year. Uh, our budget does reflect on that sheet. It does reflect for one more person to be hired. His money's in there to hire another person when we find that person, and we're going to try to take our time in finding the right person uh, to fill uh, the job of uh, youth and ministry of music and things. So you pray for us. Keep praying for us that we will find that person. God will send that person to us, and uh, we will be able to, to uh, move on that as well. There's money in our budget set aside for that. I'm going to open the floor now just uh, uh, for uh, any questions, any thoughts. And uh, uh, we certainly appreciate your uh, uh, input in this. And uh, certainly we try to, as a group of 
uh, godly men. I want to say that. I believe we have a, 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 some godly men uh, serving as your leaders. And every leader that we had last year is on board with us except Ed Lamar. And Ed, through some of the sickness and stuff that he's had in the past, he has stepped down for this next coming year. So uh, uh, keep Ed in your prayers and, uh, and, uh, and uh, as well as uh, Lois. She's, she's been... Barnes over here is one of our elders. Kirk Chandler is one of our elders. Noah, the back, the back guy, is one of the elders, and I'm one of the elders. And uh, Alan, back over here, he's one of our deacons. And Dan is one of our deacons. And so is uh, uh, Stan as one of our deacons. All right, thank you. Right. So, uh, uh, encourage these men uh, down through the uh, days and weeks and months and this outcoming year that we have before us. Uh, and we appreciate you folks. We really do. You're the body of Christ, and that's most important. Mm -hmm. Appreciate our minister, our preacher, and his family. And appreciate Jennifer and the job she's doing for us. Thank you. But we have several projects uh, that we have in mind, and uh, uh, Lord willing, uh, we're going to get some of those projects started in the next uh, two or three months, and uh, we've got some bids going out. For example, we've done got some bids back on the flooring downstairs that we're going to put a new flooring in downstairs. I've got some work going on for the sign, and uh, Noah and, and uh, Brian's been working on that, and as soon as we get that and get everything in line, you know, that's just a matter of purchasing that and taking the other one down, putting the new one up, and uh, uh, a few little things, odds and ends that we got to do there, and that's get uh, electric out there. So we're going to have an electrical sign out there that advertise Smoky Mountain Christian Church on the top or the bottom. I don't know. We can do either or, and uh, we look at that whenever we put put that together with the eldership and the leaders. Uh, but it also have messages out there that we can advertise. Uh, like the preacher's got the banner out there now for the uh, dinner that we're going to have. And he could have that flashing, you know, and other things on there. For instance, sunrise services and stuff like that. It's very, very nice. I've seen it on, on the uh, uh, other end on what it can do. So keep us in mind there. And we think that that's just one of the things that's going to help us to get our church out there especially in this community and things and and that's what we want to want to reach out and that's what i believe brother joel was uh talking about in his message today so uh and and then uh with, with some lighting over in the uh, uh in the annex building and uh a uh, few other things the baptistry and making sure it's going to be working right and be uh sufficient every lord's day and we got some things going on in that. We're going to be working on that. Make sure that we have things like that ready. Because God's going to send us some people, I believe. You believe that? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, pull that thing up. I got to use this thing. <laughs> Amen. Okay. All right. Uh, we, got to, we got to have that in our heart and for us, to, for us to be able to move forward, I think. And I think... Uh, Smoky Mountain is ready to move forward. So uh, the floor is open. We either got a lot of good, satisfied people, and I pray that we do. And uh, and I I know you know I don't want to scare you. You know I'm I'm a man that's jolly a lot of times, and uh, uh, but uh, seems like you're just silent. Maybe you're reading. Maybe you're looking at those. Okay, we'll give you just a few minutes on that. Anything at the other leadership guys want to add? Brother? Uh, this is, this is my, one of my favorite times of year for a lot of reasons, you know. Um, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all that kind of stuff. As you know, we're doing a lot of outreach stuff right now to the community and that sort of stuff. Um, James talked about we got to pray that God's going to send stuff people to us. Um, 
I, I'm not to go against what James is saying. I think he'll agree with me on this once I explain what I'm saying here. But um, actually, God, God told us to go and make disciples. All right. Um, Smoky Mountain, if we're going to grow in the coming year and years to come, it really it falls on us as a congregation. All right. You, I've preached over and over over the past year, and I'll continue to preach in the coming year. I'm going to kind of share with you what my theme for the kind of coming year sermons are going to be in a moment. But, you know, it, it's up to us to go out and, like Joe was saying today, live life on mission.